Okay, welcome back. This is the program we finished up with at the end of the last session. We've got a comment telling us what the program does. Then we're grabbing the system library by doing an import. Then we're getting all of the file names we're supposed to process by looking at that magic list sys.argv. sys.argv meaning the argv list from the sys library. We're subscripting from one to the end because we don't want element zero, that's the name of our program. We're certainly not going to try to read that as a data file. And then for each file name in that list, we're going to, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We're going to do 12 lines. And there's a lot going on in those 12 lines. This is too complicated. Yes, I can figure it out. But remember 7 plus or minus 2. You want people who are reading programs to only have to remember a small number of things, to only have to understand and piece together a small number of things at any time. And there's too much going on in here. Just in this else alone, there's one, two, three, four, five, six different things I'd have to explain in order to explain what's going on here. And I know that because there were six different things that I had to explain when I wrote it the first time. So let's see how we can simplify this. I'm going to shift back to a terminal and I'm going to run IPython. And I'm going to define a new function. I'm going to create a new verb that Python will then know how to do. Let's define double of number to be return two times number. All right. If I ask what is double, it's a function. And if I say double of three, it returns six. If I say double of 17, it returns 34. Yep, that's right. If I say double of 0 0.5, it gives me 1. And if I say double of hello, it says hello, hello, because it's taking whatever I give it and multiplying that by 2 and giving it back. So let's have another look at our definition. I said def double of number. I should actually call it thing, because sometimes it's a string. It's not always a number. Return 2 times thing. Whoops, I've got a typing mistake there. I said two times think instead of two times think. Let's see what happens when I try to run this. Double of three, I get an error because the name think isn't defined. I'm trying to use a variable called think before I've given a variable called think a value. The variable I've actually got is called thing. So let's try this one more time. Def double of thing is return to times thing. All right, now double of three is six. So here's what's happening. And if you have a picture in your head of what happens when you call a function, everything else gets easier. Right now, in my program, I've got a bunch of variable names floating around. I've said x equals three, y equals 15, and z, z for those of you south of the border, is 271. They're all floating around here. When I call a function, what I do is take all of that and push it down out of the way and put another whiteboard on top of that, which is blank. I can now start filling in that whiteboard. That whiteboard belongs to a particular call to the function double. And it's only got one variable, thing. What's the value of the variable thing? Well, it's initially assigned whatever value was passed in when I called the function. In the case here on the screen, it's assigned the value 3. The variable is going to be called thing, but it's inside the function double. It's not in the program as a whole. It belongs to a particular call to the function double. When that call to double finishes, we're going to take that upper whiteboard, the one that has the variable thing, and we're going to throw it away and bring back all of the previous variable definitions that we had. It's called a stack because it's like a stack of plates. Initially, we've got one plate. That's all of the variables that we've defined in the main body of our program. That's x, y, and z. I'm trying to be American here. Then we call the function thing. We take another plate and we stick it on top of that first plate. And now all we can see is the top of that plate that belongs to the function double. The only variable that's on that plate is the one called thing. What value does it have? Well, when we called double, we passed in a value. 
what we meant was take this value 3 and make it the initial value of the variable d thing. When we're finished with the function double, we take that plate and we throw it away, crash, bang, boom on the floor, and that variable thing disappears. Right? I said double of 3, that gave me 6. There is no variable called thing. Thing only exists as long as we're inside a call to the function. When we're finished, we throw that plate away, and now the top plate is the one that has x, y, and z. All right. Let's see what happens if we go double of 2 times 5 plus 1. Well, we're going to calculate 2 times 5 plus 1, which is 11, and then we're going to put that on the plate, which holds all the variables for the function double. So thing will have the value 11. This should return 22, and it does. But there isn't a 22 in our main program anymore. There isn't an 11 in our main program, because we didn't store that in a variable on that bottom plate. If, on the other hand, I say result is double of 2 times 5 plus 1, 11 gets passed in, so that goes into double as the value of thing. Double does its job, and then double gives us something back, and we assign it to result, and that's still in this bottom plate. That's in the same plate as x, y, and z because we got it back from the function and we assigned it to a variable when this was our current plate. This was our current layer of variables. This model is called a call stack because I can do this. Let's define quadruple of something to be return double of something plus double of something. Now, what happens when I call quadruple of 2. Uh, let's make it more interesting. Quadruple of 7. Well, currently I've got a plate that has x, y, z in result. When I call quadruple, I'm going to put another plate on top of that. It's just going to have the variable something, and initially that variable will have the value 7. Then I'll put another plate on top of that for my first call to double, and that value 7 will be passed into double and that double will return 14, because that's what double does. I'll then call double again, also passing in 7, because something still has the value 7, and I'll get back another 14. I'll add those two 14s to get 28, and that will be the result of quadruple. Excellent. What I've done is create a stack of three plates. My initial global variables, the ones defined at the top level, are hidden by the plate that represents quadruple, that's hidden by the plate that represents double, but then we take that plate away. Then we put on another plate for the second call to double, because we've got two calls to double inside quadruple. We take that plate away, then we take away the quadruple plate, and each time we take away a plate, we return the answer to whatever called it. So we've done plate, plate, take away, plate, take away, take away, and now we're left with our global variables. If you understand that model of a call stack, of these layers of variables, and at any point you can only see what's in your current layer, then you know the most important thing you need to know about structuring programs. There's one more piece of information I want to give you, and then we'll go back and solve our initial problem. Let's define show of stuff to be print inside show stuff is initially stuff and then say stuff is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, print at the end of show stuff is stuff. So if I say show of 1 inside, we put the plate for show on top, and we assign the value 1 to stuff. So we see inside show stuff is initially 1. Then we change the value. We just assigned a new value to stuff inside the call to the function. So now it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we took that plate away. There isn't a variable called stuff in the main program because the plate that it was on has been thrown in the garbage or sent off to the dishwasher or something. What happens if we say stuff is original value of stuff? So now in our main plate that has all our global variables, we've got a variable called stuff, and it's got a string value, original value of stuff. What happens if I now say show of 1? Well, is my global variable, is the variable that's on the main plate called stuff going to be affected by what the function does? The answer is no. And here's why. I've got a plate that's got a variable called stuff 
and it's got the value, original value of stuff. But then I put another plate on top, and that plate has its own variable called stuff. That's the one that we change, but then we throw away that change when we throw away the plate, and we're left with our original stuff variable and its original value. This is why functions behave this way. If I'm writing a function that does something like calculate entropy across a matrix, I might use variables called i and j and e. You might, well, I shouldn't use i, j, and e. Single letter variables are usually a bad idea, but work with me here. You might have variables called i, j, and e in the main body of your program. You don't want the things I do in my function to affect your variables. You wrote your code without looking inside my entropy calculator. All you know is that you call entropy of matrix and it gives you back a number. You don't want to have a whole bunch of side effects where it not only gives you back the entropy, but it also changes the values of variables called i, j, and e if you happen to have them in your function. You don't want all of its content to leak out and infect the rest of your code. And this is why we use this call stack model for functions. All the variables that are defined in a function only live as long as the life of that function. And if they happen to have the same name as something deeper down, that's not a problem. The variables belong to the function. They're thrown away when that function goes away. And nothing that happens to have the same name elsewhere in the current call stack gets affected. Now, older languages didn't work this way. Some older dialects of Lisp or Fortran didn't respect the stack convention. And we found out the hard way that it makes code very difficult to maintain. It's very hard to keep coming up with unique names for variables. And even if you do, even if you go and you read the entropy calculator source code and say, right, the only variables there are i, j, and e, I just have to make sure that I don't use those as variable names. A year from now, somebody rewrites the entropy calculator to use more meaningful variables like x index, y index, and entropy so far. You happen to have used the variable x index because you knew it wasn't going to collide with any of the names in the original entropy calculator, but now somebody changes the entropy calculator and now after the fact, there's a problem. It makes large code impossible to maintain. So, we're trying to break things down into lumps and one of the ways we do that is to put code in functions and to make sure that the functions are as much of a black box as possible. Pass things in, get results out. There shouldn't be side effects. Occasionally, there are side effects. We talk about this in the main lectures online. But the ideal is to have functions that don't do anything except return a value. There's no other visible behavior. 